Today is what day? Sunday. Sunday, very good. What day? Pentecost. What does Pentecost mean? 50 days. Why 50 days? It was the what? The time till the first harvest from when? What are we counting from? Passover. Counting from Passover. Okay, so Pentecost is not just a day that is Holy Spirit Day. It, was, it is a feast of the Lord. It is a day of the Lord. Uh, Acts chapter 2 is the story of the day of Pentecost in the New Testament when the disciples were gathered in the upper room. You all are aware of that story? And uh, that day fire really came. Amen. The fire came down and rested on their heads and, and uh, the power of God, the presence of God came. And so the disciples on that day were completely changed from who they had been before the day of Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit came into their lives. And so in Acts chapter 2 is this story, and I just want to read the first couple of verses. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly... There came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house while, where they were sitting. And there appeared on them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Then it goes through the list of all the nationalities in verse 12. And they continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? What would happen if every time we got together to worship, we left the place with a sense of, What does this mean? What does it mean when... when, when when we experienced what we experienced, what would happen if there were a, if there were a groundbreaking, shaking reality every time we got together? I believe that God wants us to expect the manifest presence of His Spirit every time we get together and to walk away from every time we meet saying, Wow, I don't know if I get it all, but I know God was here. Amen? Amen. And, and, and what we see, and the, the most important thing I want you to see in Acts chapter 2 is, is, is yes, they spoke in tongues. That's, I mean, fire came and sat on their heads. That's, that's pretty unique. Uh, as far as I know, that's the only time that ever happened. But fire came on their heads and they spoke in tongues. But the most, the most profound reality, the most profound shift in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost is the day after versus the day before in the life of those who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Because they were totally transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says they became bold and they began to speak boldly about Jesus. I believe for that kind of boldness for you and me that the power of the Holy Spirit would infuse us and empower us and embolden us in that same kind of way. Today and in every coming day. I want to talk to you this morning about getting real and having a real life with this real God. What, is the, what does it look like to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? What does it really look like to live a real life with a real God? And I want to begin by, by suggesting to you this morning, let's get real. How many of you would like to get real today? I would like to see us get real. Get real with God. Get real with each other. Get real with the Holy Spirit. And so here's the first thing I want to ask today in regard to getting real with the Holy Spirit. Why do we want the Holy Spirit? In Acts chapter 8, if you just want to turn back a couple of pages, if you're using old-fashioned pages like I am, and turn back to Acts chapter 8, verse 9, I want to read you a quick story about why do we want the Holy Spirit that might address this issue for us. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 9. It says, Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was, pra was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. Verse 12. But when they believed Philip, <clears throat> excuse me, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and was as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So we got a magician 
who has been known in the area, known in the region as someone who practiced magic, sort of known as a person who was part of the gods or something. And, and now he's become a believer and he's following Philip around and he's seeing these miracles take place and he's amazed. Verse 14, and when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for he had not yet fallen upon many of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that anyone with whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, but Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for, you, for me yourself, so that nothing of, of what you have said to me may come upon, may come upon me. Here's a, here's a story in Scripture about the Holy Spirit. Why do you want the Holy Spirit? So this story shows about this guy, and he starts to look around. And what is he noticing? When these people lay hands, this, this Holy Spirit thing comes, and that, that's pretty cool. And, and he's starting to get intrigued with this fact that it's laid on hands and it comes and people speak in tongues and people getting the Holy Spirit. And he says, hey, here's, here's a hundred bucks or if it's Evan, here's a dollar. And, and he says, Here, here's some money because I want the Holy Spirit. And Peter recognizes you don't want the Holy Spirit for the right reason when you're going to pay for it to get it. Because you think the Holy Spirit is a commodity that can be purchased and then passed on to others. As a matter of fact, don't you know that if he's thinking, if he buys it, he can probably start selling it down the road. He can probably start so he'd come, come into town and say, listen, I got something that you need and it'll only cost you a subscription to a 12-week course. And after the 12-week course, you only have to pay 99 cents a day or whatever. And he has this scheme. And his mind is thinking he can sell the Holy Spirit. He thinks the Holy Spirit is something that he can take and use for what he wants to do. And if that's why anybody wants the Holy Spirit, I can tell you that God is not going to anoint you and fill you with the Holy Spirit. Why do we want the Holy Spirit? Why do we want Him? Uh, Francis Chan in his book, Forgotten God, says, The Holy Spirit is not a commodity to be bought or traded according to our individual wants, whims, or even our felt needs. So why should, why should we want the Holy Spirit? Why should we want the Holy Spirit? And 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 answers this question. It says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit, for the common good. The reason we ought to want the Holy Spirit is so that I will become more effective for your good. So that I will become more empowered for your good, for your benefit, for your blessing, for the church, for the common good of everybody. Not so I will get some supernatural ability to overcome something in my life. Those are things that the Holy Spirit does in your life. But the reason to want the Holy Spirit is because of the other people sitting in the room. The other people in your family, the other people in your workplace, the other people all around you. Because I'll tell you this today, you will never accomplish being the Christian God wants you to be, being the witness God wants you to be. You'll never accomplish it without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, without the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. You can't be selfless without the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us to look at others and care for others and build into others. And so the reason we should want the Holy Spirit is because we are here for the common good. The Holy Spirit is all about health, authenticity, purpose, a healthy church family, God's purposes being fulfilled. And it is, it is the Holy Spirit's passion to see God glorified on the earth. I'm going to ask you a question today. I want you to think about this, and you might think about it through this week. How much do you love the church? How much do you care for the church? And when I say the church, I obviously don't mean this building. I mean the people sitting around you. How much do you love and care for the people, the church? That's a, actually a, a good question for us to think about from time to time. In my life, the priorities of my life, am I considering God's 
presence on the earth as primary for my life, that I'm pouring my life out for the church? How much do you love the church? The Holy Spirit is about a stronger church, are you? Holy Spirit is about a lasting church, are you? Holy Spirit is about a people who are bold and passionate about God and His kingdom, are you? Philippians 1, 23 to 25, I am hard pressed from both directions. Paul is describing his life. Listen to Paul. Paul has served and Paul is, is a, a minister and Paul has experienced very difficult things because of his, his uh, being in where God wants him to be. He says, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better. Yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Paul said, it would be so much better for me if I could just go to heaven. But you need me here. And so I'm going to continue to suffer in this life for your sake. That is the reason to want the Holy Spirit. Because of you. Because of the people around you. Just, just for just a moment, look around and go ahead and point. This is your, your chance to point. Because of you. Just point at the people around you. Say, because of you. Because of you. Because of you. I need the Holy Spirit. Well, on Friday's video that I sent out, some of you saw that already. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer two questions today. What might be stopping Holy Spirit from being active in your life? What are some of the things that might be stopping? You might, you might quickly say, well, sin and you know, broken relationships. But I'm going to suggest these two areas that, that sometimes we don't think out. And the first one is comfort. Comfort may be stopping you from experiencing the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say this. I want you to hear this clearly today. Your life may be too safe for the Holy Spirit to be needed. Your life might be too safe. You may, you may, have, you may have put yourself in a place where you don't, you, you're protecting yourself from anything that's out there. And so it's a very safe place. It's very comfortable. We are, we are, we are um, how shall I say this? We, are, we tend to be pretty good at building comfort into our lives. I'm not talking about the bed you sleep on. I'm talking about the decisions you make about what you're going or not to do. What you're going to do or not to do. We build comfort. We say, well, that we could never do that before we even stop and say, Holy Spirit, do you want me to do that? We say, well, we could never, we could never go to, uh, go to a, a, a foreign land somewhere and we could never do this or we could never reach out to the neighbors or we could never. And we, we build comfort into our life, which is a primary reason for us to be living. I'm going to read you a quick story. Uh, it says, I recently, this is Francis Chan again. He said, I recently had dinner in Seoul, Korea with an amazing man. He was one of 23 missionaries who were held hostage by the Taliban in Afghanistan in July 2007. For those who don't recall the story, the Taliban executed two of the missionaries before a deal was reached with the government of South Korea and the missionaries were released. This man told me about the horrors of being locked up in a cell, knowing that martyrdom was a strong possibility. He also shared about the amazing time they had on the last day they were all imprisoned together. Their captors later divided them into groups of three and took them to remote areas. Each of the 23 missionaries surrendered their lives to God that night and told him they were willing to die for his glory. There was even an argument, are you ready, over who would go first. Who would get to die first? One of them had a small Bible that, mission, that, that the missionaries secretly ripped into 23 pieces so each could glance at Scripture when no one was watching. The Word of God and the Spirit of God got them through the 40 days of imprisonment. One of the most fascinating things this man told me was about what has happened since. Okay, so they were imprisoned and they had this extreme experience. He said, now that they've been back in Seoul for a while, several team members have asked him, don't you wish we were still there? He tells me that several of them experienced a deep kind of intimacy with God in the prison cell that they haven't been able to recapture in their comfort. This is the precious gift of intimacy the Holy Spirit offers us. It is a security that is priceless and worth any loss of safety and comfort, even imprisonment by the Taliban. Is it possible that your life is so comfortable you don't need the comforter? That you are so safe that you don't need protection, that you are making your decisions in such a natural mindset that you need no supernatural guidance or direction. 
our need to have the Holy Spirit with us is directly linked to how much we're moving in our plans versus how much we're stretching and moving in God's plans. I got a text message on Friday when I asked for how to pray for people, and Brandon and Melissa are, are on in Virginia Beach. I don't know if they're there for a week or just the weekend, but he, he, this is what his, he said, Pastor, would you pray for us? He said, we want, we want to go outside of ourselves. We want to be led by the Spirit. We want to find people that need God, and we want to share God, and we want to see miracles happen. That's not very comfortable. They're going on vacation. I mean, why would you want that? Go on vacation and, and, and bless yourselves. No, that's the kind of prayer I believe that God will answer. Would you agree with me that God would answer that? How many of you would agree with me? I don't know when they're coming back, but just praying for them that God will do God miracle kinds of things in them and through them because that's what they're asking for because it's about others. They want to see God move in other, people, other people's lives. That to me is stretching outside of ourselves and into a place where we need the Holy Spirit. Second thing that may be stopping you from experiencing the Holy Spirit in your life is simply the word volume. The volume of our life is too high. Maybe your life is just too loud to hear and to receive and need the Holy Spirit. What kind of condition is your mind in? You know, to get your heart in condition, what do you have to do? Exercise it. You have to exercise it. You have to be intentional about exercising it. To get your mind into condition, what do you have to do? Exercise it. And one of the exercises that your mind needs is quiet. I have done this ex experiment before in church during the worship time. I have specifically set a clock in front of me, and I've said, let's just be quiet before the Lord. And I have painfully counted the seconds to get to a full minute of silence in a group like this. Do you know how hard that is? It's very hard. If I stopped right now and we just sat here for a minute, it would seem like ages to most of us because our mind is not in a condition to quiet itself and hear from God. Why does that matter? Well, that matters because of the story in the Bible when Elijah, you remember Elijah? Elijah was a great prophet of God. He goes out and he has this battle with the prophets of Baal and, and he, he, he dumps water and everything all over the thing and he prays and God sends fire and he kills like 400 prophets of Baal that day. And I mean, it's just like, yeah, he's the big guy. And the next day, Jezebel sends him a message. She says, I'm going to get you. That's paraphrasing, but that's what she said. She, I'm going to get you. And he, and he shrinks in fear and he runs and hides. You all know that story? Right after a great victory, he runs and hides. He's hiding away, right? And so he, he's hiding in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you want to turn there today, I want, to, I want to look at this passage. In 1 Kings chapter 19, God finds him. That's in quotes, God finds him. God knew where he was, but God comes to him. And uh, chapter 19, verse 9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. So Elijah has just won this huge victory for God, has seen... I mean, can you imagine the, the miracle of the, of the power of God coming in that fire and burning up those offerings and, and just God coming through in a powerful, powerful way? And then right after that, he's hiding in a cave. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, I love God. I love when he says things like this. What are you doing here, Elijah? Like he doesn't know. Like, like what he said to Adam... Where are you? Like he didn't know. I love it when he asks the obvious questions that we need to answer. He says to Elijah, he said, what are you doing here? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he said, God said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord. He repeats it himself. How did Elijah hear the voice of God? After all the noise got out of the way, the quiet, still, small voice. Is it hard for you to be quiet? Is it hard for you to put your 
phone aside for more than 15 minutes, your computer aside, your iPod aside. You, when you get in the car, do you turn the radio on first thing? Do you, get, do, you, do you have noise around you all the time? I tend to be a noise person. I tend to always have some, some noise going on. So, um, so last night while I was finishing up the sermon, I had the hockey game on just so I, just so I had noise going on. Um, I tend to, when I'm riding with people, I tend to need conversation. Anybody else like that? So like when, I, when, it, when Evan and I used to ride together, that was no problem. <laughs> right? Because there's plenty to talk about and plenty of people who like to talk. And so talk, 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 talk. And then I started just like going from place to place with Caleb. And I'm like, what's wrong? You're not talking. So finally one time I said to him, I said, would it be just totally fine with you if we rode the whole way home, like a 20-minute ride, it'd be totally fine with you if neither of us said anything? He said, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I can take a hint. But the whole time I'm sitting there going. Because <laughs> it's hard for me to have quiet. And I think it's easier for some people to have quiet than it is for other people. But all of us, listen to me, all of us, no matter whether you're a quiet or a loud person, all of us are overwhelmed right now with so much noise, so much noise of technology, so much noise of advertisements, so much noise of news, so much noise in our lives, that if we're not careful, the volume of our life will keep us from hearing the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to recognize comfort and volume are two things that God would like us to look at in our lives. Let me just give you, uh, to wrap things up here this morning, what does real life look like in the Spirit? So this is like a, an in the Spirit guide. What does it look like to be in the Spirit? And I want to talk a little bit about, again, motives and, and things like that. Next Sunday, Wanda Alger is going to be here sharing the message, and you are going to be encouraged. She, she plans to share extremely practical ways that we can see God moving through us in our everyday life. And I know you'll be encouraged um, as you experience that together. So today, let's talk about uh, what does real life look like in the Spirit. So first of all, it, to be in the Spirit, we need to have a real reason. And I already mentioned this. This is just a follow-up from earlier. But we need to have a real reason to be in the Spirit or to live in the Spirit or to walk in the Spirit. And the real reason that all of us must embrace is it is for the common good of of the church. That's why God gives the Holy Spirit and God gives gifts for the common good of the church. Now the church has a role to reach the reach the lost. So don't get confused that the Holy Spirit doesn't give gifts for the lost. But here's what you need to understand. The Holy Spirit gives gifts for the church so the church will become who we're supposed to be, then we'll reach the lost if we are being who we're supposed to be. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit gives gifts for the common good. Everybody say that. For the common good. The Holy Spirit is given first so that you'll be a blessing to these people in the room. He's concerned about this family. He's concerned about the church around the world. And he's concerned about giving gifts so that you will be blessed to bless others. Not so you'll feel warm and fuzzy and tingly and fall over and all those cool things that can happen when you get the Holy Spirit. It's always for the other people. Everybody with me? So you have to have a real reason to want to live in the Spirit. I believe this is a primary reason if we're going to see miracles, we have to embrace this reality that the Holy Spirit isn't for me, isn't for a miracle in my life. The Holy Spirit is so that I will become active in your life. So that I will become active in blessing you. So that I'll get a word from the Lord and encourage you. Because how many of you know that if I come to you, if I come to you this morning and I say, I'm going to pick Jonathan out of the room. And I say, Jonathan, the Lord gave me a word for you. And I begin to share with you, and it is absolutely relevant to something that's going on in your life. And you know you didn't tell me about it. How many of you know that's going to be more of an effect than if God begins to speak to Jonathan and tell him the same thing? What does Jonathan do if he's hearing it for himself? He could be making that up. I mean, do I even know if this is God? Do I even? So that's just one example. Why does God? Because you need me to be filled with the Holy Spirit so I will be actively encouraging and building you up and, and strengthening you so that you'll become who God wants you to be and vice versa. I need you. The other people need you. That's why when we come to church on Sunday morning, we cannot be about what am I going to get today. 
We can't be about what am I going to get. Man, I hope I get blessed. I hope I get filled. Yeah, I hope you do too. But what about if God wants to send you there with a word of encouragement for somebody else? Have you ever spent time on Sunday morning and said, Lord, I'm going to pray over the list. I'm going to pray over the people of the church. Give me a word for somebody today. Wouldn't that change our attitude in coming to church? Just say, well, I'm going to get some good worship today. No, that's not why you're here. You will be blessed when you come and you get infused with the Spirit for other people. Does that, does that make sense? So number one, we have to have a real reason so that we want to live in the Spirit for other people. Francis Chan again, he says, The Spirit desires to use us when our hearts are aligned with this vision, when we are filled with genuine love for the church, and when we desire to see the church grow in love for God and others. The second thing about living a real life with a real God is who's keeping track? Who's keeping track? track. In John 16, 14, Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, he said, he will glorify me for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. The primary purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus and draw attention to Jesus. So if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we're going to live a Spirit-filled life, we need to become a people who set our goal in life to glorify Jesus. You know, if God wants to move through me someday and do miracles through me, I want Jesus to be seen, not me. But the problem is there are too many, quote, gifted people who are getting a lot of attention themselves. And that's not the Holy Spirit who does that. The Holy Spirit brings glory and, 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 and brings honor to Jesus. 1 Corinthians 14 after Paul lists the, gift, the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says, uh, you know, there are all of these gifts. And, but then he goes on and he starts talking about the church in Corinth. And he describes a church that was chaotic. He describes a church that was like everybody had to give their gift and everybody had to say their thing. And so there were just people standing up and giving a word and blah, blah, blah. And it was just chaotic. He said, that's not, that's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. It's not, you're not here to prove that you have the Holy Spirit. You're here to be a blessing to other people. He had to bring some order to the chaos because the people were thinking, hey, 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 I got a word too. Hey, I got a word. You know what? Hey, I got a word. And they're drawing attention to themselves. That's not what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives or through us. If a clear sign that God is at work in your life, a clear sign that God is at work in, in the church is this. God is being magnified in everything that is done. Jesus is being lifted high in everything that is done. And when the people leave, they remember that God was there, not so-and-so who preached a good message or so-and-so who did this. They remember God was in this place. I'm not here to say that, that's, that we we're hitting that goal. I, I don't know that we are. I want us to see God more and more magnified. I want people to give testimony about what God did in their lives. I want Jesus to be lifted up. But that's a clear sign of, what, of real life in the Spirit when God is magnified, when Jesus is lifted up. Number three, second come miracles. Second comes miracles. There's another danger in regard to the Holy Spirit when we start to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and that is we become miracle seekers. We just want to see a miracle. I just want to see a miracle. God, we just need a miracle. I want to see a miracle. Now, to be honest, when you see a miracle, when you witness a miracle, it is, it is awesome to behold. It is awesome to say God was, God was here and God did this. But making miracles the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit misses what God wants to do in our life. See, miracles come second. Miracles come after. Miracles come then. First, we need to ask for the supernatural anointing of God to love others at all times. How many of you need a little help in that area? To love others at all times. I need a lot of help in that area, right? And, and we need to ask for the anointing, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you transform me? I was meeting with a friend the other day, and we were talking about how different it is in relationships if we would stop and look at my, my own self. I've mentioned this, this to you in the last couple of weeks. But when there's a conflict that comes up, if, you, if we'll stop and say, am I thinking about myself or am I thinking about that person? I guarantee you if you'll do that, you'll see that you're thinking about yourself. You're upset because your rights are being violated. You're upset because, because they didn't do what they should do for you or whatever. And, and we need the Holy Spirit's anointing to be able to uh, love other people unconditionally. 
You can't do it without the anointing, without the power of the Holy Spirit. First, we ask Him to anoint us to see things through His eyes. First, we ask God to lead us and guide us to His place and His agenda. Second, everybody say second. Second, we believe that He wants to do miracles beyond our abilities. I know that God wants to do miracles. I know that God wants to show up in profound ways, but that cannot be the primary purpose for seeking the power of the Holy Spirit because you miss the transformation that He wants to do in your life that allows and releases the miracles into other people's lives. Listen, church, we are never called to conjure up miracles. Make a miracle happen. We're never called to do that. God will do miracles and he will do it in our midst and we should ask for miracles and all of that, but we're never called to make them happen. We're called to pursue the Holy Spirit for transformation of my life so that I will become who he wants me to be. Uh, uh, fourthly, in this area of real God and real life is are we followers or are we leaders? Here's a simple question to ask yourself. Do I want to be led by the Holy Spirit or do I want to lead him? Do I want to be led by the Holy Spirit or would I rather lead Him? Now, I want to remind you, the Holy Spirit is not a passive power that you can wield when you want. He's not a superpower that you can turn on and turn off. He, he's, not, he's not what you see in the movies all the time. Holy Spirit is God and as such, He demands complete submission. So when we talk about wanting the Holy Spirit, we need to first of all answer the question, do I want to be led by the Holy Spirit? Do I want to submit myself to Holy Spirit who has a mind, has a will, has emotions, has a plan? Have you ever wondered these things? What if Holy Spirit asks me to give away everything I have? What if Holy Spirit asked me to move to a city or to some foreign land or to some dangerous place? What if Holy Spirit tells me to leave the comfortable job I have and begin a job that is very difficult? What if Holy Spirit tells me to stay in the job I loathe? Not loathe, in the job I loathe. What if Holy Spirit tells me to, tells me to do something difficult? Do we want the Holy Spirit then? See, I think there's a critical, a critical reality of real life with a real God is, am I, am I ready to go where he says to go, to be who he says to be, to do what he says to do? Am I ready to submit myself? Listen, you may be the parents of young children today, and you may say, well, the Holy Spirit surely wouldn't ask us to go to a dangerous place. Really? Why, why did we make that a rule? When, who's leading? You, you, may, you may have kids, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I step on any toes of anybody who's ever been a missionary and ever done this, but I see this a very common move among missionaries to move home for the high school years of their, their kids. I understand why they do that. I understand what they're thinking, but did Holy Spirit tell them to do that or did everything natural say this is the right thing to do? I, I'm not, I, don't, I'm, I think God would say this is what you need to do. I understand that. Are you really ready to be led by and submit yourself completely to the Spirit of God? That's a question of living real life. See, everybody wants the shiny, fancy, nice part of the Holy Spirit. The question is, do we want the submission part of the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to submit to whatever He calls us to do? Are, you, are we followers or leaders? Do I want the Holy Spirit to lead me. The final thing I want to look at here in this area of, of living a real life with a real God, real God is what does it mean to be led and called by the Spirit? Sometimes in a charismatic or a Spirit-filled body of believers, this phrase comes up probably more than it should. Well, the Lord led me to this or the Lord called me to this place. Certainly, the Holy Spirit leads us and calls us. But here's a question for you in the area of being led and called. Did God call you to be where you are at this point in your life? In other words, all of you are here. Most of you live in Harrisonburg area, in the Harrisonburg area. Did God call you to live here? Did He lead you? 
to live here? And if you say yes to that, here's the next question. What difference would it make if you weren't here? Did God call you to be a part of this body of believers, this, this church family? If the answer to that is yes, then the, answer, the next question is, what difference would it make if you weren't here? Is God doesn't just send you somewhere to settle down and get comfortable. That, you won't find that in Scripture. You, you find God sending, sending people somewhere to make a difference to make an impact, to take land, to take, take territory, to, to leave an impact, to raise up His glory. He sends us for a purpose. So if God has called you and led you to this place or to this church or to this family or whatever, the questions you need to ask is, what am I doing because I'm here? What difference would it make if you were not a part of this church family or if you were not in the job that you're in? Would the people who work with you notice it if you were gone? And if they would, what would they notice? Would they be relieved? Or would they be looking for somebody else that they can go to with, that has the presence of God? Do you understand the questions? So we talk about being led and called by the Spirit, but for what purpose? For what purpose? If it is to make a comfortable life, I challenge that you're not following the plan of God for your life. Real life, with real God, with the Holy Spirit, we need to evaluate the following questions. Am I leadable? Am I listening? Am I learning? Am I longing for more of life in my God? Am I leadable? Am I listening? Am I learning? Am I longing for more of God in my life? When Holy Spirit leads us, let me just finish with this. When Holy Spirit leads us and guides us, more often than not, it is not a gentle downhill walk. Downhill walk. More often than not, it is an uphill struggle to get to the place he's taking us to. I'm not saying there, are, there aren't times in our life where we have peace and we have comfort and where it where it's, feels easy. I'm not, I, I know the Lord gives us rest. That's part of his character. But more often than not, when Holy Spirit is leading us, it's into a place that we can't do ourselves. And when we get moving into a place where we can't do this ourselves, then we need the Holy Spirit. And when we need the Holy Spirit and we ask for Him to anoint us for that, then we become who the Holy Spirit wants us to be. And then miracles can come out of our lives and people will see God in us and not see us accomplishing great things in our own strength. Holy Spirit wants to make you more, wants to make you more beneficial to those around you. And he's shaping you by giving you gifts to serve others. He's pointing out areas that are not aligned with God's purposes. He will take us to where we can become ever more like Jesus and we say we're, we're in love with him more and more. So when the Holy Spirit leads, we become more loving. That's inevitable if you're led by the Spirit. You become a more loving person. Because the Spirit knows the mind of God and the Bible says God is love. <laughs> so becoming more like God means you become much more loving. And right after 1 Corinthians 12, where this whole list of gifts, and uh, Paul uh, talks about all the different manifestations and the gifts of God, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, is 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 says what? Man, if you could teach with the tongue, you could speak with the tongues of men and angels, you, you, man, you could be the most awesome, spirit-filled person ever, but if you don't have love, it's worthless. So ultimately, the Holy Spirit is about making us a loving people, loving God and loving each other with a deeper love than we could do in our own. When we live with a real life, with a real God, we love others with God's love, and we grow in love and become more loving every day. This morning, we're going to wrap up our service with communion. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and prepare. And, uh, but before we do that, let me give you a couple of things to a couple of things for homework this week to take home with you to, to process as we go from here. Number one, would you take the time this week to ask yourself these questions? Do I want to be led or do I want to use the Holy Spirit? Do I want to be led by the Holy Spirit or do I want to use the Holy Spirit? What does the comfort, what does the comfort level of my life say about my relationship to Holy Spirit? What does the comfort level of my life say about my relationship to the Holy Spirit. Number three, is there something I know He has spoken to me, yet I'm unwilling to take action on it? 
Many times in, in believers' lives, we know what the Holy Spirit has said. We just choose to not follow, choose not to submit. Is there something the Holy Spirit has already spoken to you that you need to take action on? Number two, evaluate your love quotient. If it's all about becoming more loving, if the Holy Spirit's ultimate goal is to make us more loving, evaluate your love quotient. How much are you acting in love? <laughs> I think it was Tim Keller who tweeted the other day, if each spouse says to the other, check this out spouses, if each spouse says to the other, I will treat my selfishness as the main problem in the marriage, you have the prospect for great things. Did y'all hear that? If each spouse would look at the other and say, I'm going to treat my selfishness as the main problem in this marriage, you have great prospect for great things. Life is about others, isn't it? It's about giving. It's about loving. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Number three, ask God to show you where he wants you to go and then go there. Where does God want you to be? Where does he want to lead you? Who does he want you to pray for? Who does he want you to talk to? Every moment of every day, who do you want me to speak to today? Who do you want me to talk to right now? Do you want me to pray for these people? What do you want me to do, Holy Spirit? Ask him to show you and then do it. And begin to live a real life with a real God for his glory and for his purposes. Amen.